All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our brown bag today. I'm Emily Trelevin. I'm a member of the brown bag committee, and it is my pleasure to introduce Sangeeta Madhavan, who is professor and chair of African American studies and professor of sociology at the University of Maryland. Um, Sangeeta is a family demographer working in Africa and has made substantial contributions to our understanding of extended family systems, parenting, extended kind of networks, household dynamics, and child health and well-being. She is currently the PI of an NICHD-funded R01 um, that seeks to understand the interactional effects of marriage kin and kinship support on young children's development and well-being in poor urban communities in Nairobi, Kenya. And her recent research has appeared in Population and Development Review, Journal of Marriage and Family, Social Science Research, and Population Space and Place. Thank you so much for coming today. This is really big. Um, thank you so much, Emily. Thank you for the invitation. Um, it's really great to be here to connect and reconnect with folks whose work I've admired and used for a long time. So this is really, this is great. And also, this is a chance for us to share with you some sort of findings from this project. Um, you know, as any, anyone who's done data collection knows, we've been in the weeds of, you know, administering these surveys for now a couple of years. And so we're finally at the point where we can actually say, what are these data actually telling us? And so here is uh, sort of something to share with you with that. And just in case people have to sort of leave before this talk ends, the answer to this question, does marriage benefit maternal mental health, is actually yes, but, but it's not quite in the way that um, uh, you might think. Okay, so just to acknowledge my co-authors, Stel Sidze, who's at the African Population Health and Research Center, who's our main collaborator in Kenya. And then Kirsten Stovenow and Mike Wagner, both at the University of Maryland. Um, as anybody who's done data collection knows, these things require a massive team. And I just want to make sure it's, these people are acknowledged. Uh, at Maryland, we have uh, amazing graduate students who've been working with us. And then in Kenya, you know, the field team, of course, without whom none of this would be possible. So they're just sort of, I just wanted to uh, uh, recognize that. Okay, so uh, what I'm going to do is to just uh, talk a bit about the motivation significance and then tell you about the JAMA project and then really focus on what uh, we think is sort of an innovation of this project, this measure of union formalization and then the analysis and some results, and, and I'd love to get feedback in the discussion. Okay, so I have, you know, for a long time um, been interested in marriage and how it's changing, and obviously there are a whole number of, uh, lots of uh, folks who've actually looked at this issue, including people here at Michigan, but, um, Really, when you, when you think about some of the big changes that have occurred in Africa, there's been you know, this shift from formal to informal, and a lot of this uh, driven really a lot by cost. It's expensive to actually get married. Um, it's, there's some evidence that it's moving from kind of something that's kin-driven to couple-driven, um, and that couple relationship dynamics are actually holding more and more importance. Um, but at the same time, um, kin involvement, bride wealth, these things that we might sort of associate with kind of traditional practices still remain very, very important. And at this, and also the, there's also some concern that there's a fragility of unions um, is having sort of negative effects for both women and children, right? And this is all happening, of course, in the backdrop of urbanization, internal migration, uh, opportunities sort of not keeping up with um, aspirations and educational attainment, um, all of which actually last year at Sonald's PAA address was all about that, this kind of deficit in the opportunity. And this is exactly what Kenya is along with many, many urban contexts in Africa. And however, with all of this complexity, um, current large scale measures uh, that we have uh, are not sufficient for capturing change um, or actually the processual nature of marriage. Now, this is an old idea, like you know, Dominique Meekers back in 92 was talking about marriage as a process and how do we actually get at this. And while this issue of marriage as a process has been talked about a lot, we still, 
you know, what are we actually using? It seems to go back to still sort of our usual DHS conventional measures. And so here was an effort to try to contribute to actually moving um, this issue of measurement to try to better capture some of these changes that have been happening. So at the same time, um, some of you may be uh, familiar with this, but there's been a recent focus on mental health in Africa. And this is from the WHO, I think, 2022. And uh, that, um, you know, you have this extraordinary number of people, particularly women, who are at risk for depression. 85% um, I mean, have no access to effective treatment. Um, there also seems to be some evidence that interventions do help. Um, but that really, um, that, and of course also that not actually paying attention to this has effects for children's well-being, for families, for communities, all of that, right? So this is, um, uh, so this was sort of a chance to see, okay, well, can we actually learn something about sort of some of these social determinants of mental health and depression in this community which is, and as I'll show you some pictures, I mean, these are very, very um, economically precarious conditions um, where you've got all of this upheaval and social and cultural economic transition going on, right? And so trying to actually connect the two. Um, so this is just a tiny bit of the literature because there's lots of this, particularly from the US. But we do know that there have been sort of positive effects of marriage, which operate through perceived supportiveness, higher self-esteem. In fact, there was a recent piece just uh, uh, that marriage actually protects women's mental health in the context of employment loss during COVID. Um, and other people sort of talk about both, there's evidence for both a causal as well as um, causal link and selection. Um, the good news is there's actually more and more work coming out of Sub-Saharan Africa on this. And a number of people have worked, looked at the negative effects of early marriage. So I'm talking about like child marriage, um, single motherhood, um, and also marriage itself. That marriage can also be disempowering. <laughs> and so it could actually work. Uh, so it's not actually a protective feature, but it can actually put people at even greater risk, which actually is sort of linked. If you think about some of the HIV literature that we had you know, years back, same thing, sort of, you know, is marriage really protective of the, these kinds of, of behaviors? Um, and so given that what we said before, the inadequacies of measuring marriage as a process, I don't think we really know what the relationship uh, really is or what might be driving it. Okay, so with that being said, um, so three main questions are sort of to what extent does union formalization, and I'll explain what that is, protect maternal mental health in a low income urban context? To what extent does relationship quality, so this would be the couple level focus, um, explain these effects? And to what extent does emotional support from kin, and that's kind of the kin component of this, explain the effects? Okay, so the study. Uh, this is in Swahili, which is sort of a loose translation of this, uh, but really, um, Kinship, nuptiality, and child outcomes in Kenya. And the basic, so the big question in this study, as Emily mentioned, uh, to what extent does kinship support and marriage benefit mothers and children in, in a low income urban African setting? So it's a mixed methods longitudinal study with six waves of survey data and three rounds of qualitative. And uh, we started. Um, with about 1,200 mothers uh, aged 18 to 29 with at least one child that uh, uh, zero to 24 months. And then the qualitative sample, uh, which I'm not really gonna talk about today, but I'm happy to uh, answer questions if people have it. We took 50 mothers from the survey and also 30 biological fathers. And so, uh, and we've so far, we've completed four ways. We're about to actually go into round five. Um, and we've also completed two rounds of qualitative data. Um, and so one thing I just wanna say is we are now drowning in data. And so it's like, I wanna ho hold up a sign, like people need data, come to me because I'm, <laughs> because we, it's, that, it's that time, it's exciting, but also like trying to keep up, cause there's just lots. 
Um, and so if anybody's interested, please come talk to me. Um, okay, so, oh, and I wanted to say this, uh, it's six months um, is, the, is the time difference between the survey rounds, and this is mainly because of, we're looking at early child development, and six months is sort of optimum time of um, looking at some of those measures. Okay, so Podogosha and Bevendani, these are two communities in Nairobi. Um, these are densely populated areas with a combined population. I mean, it's 80,000 figures, sort of goes up and down because of a lot of movement and migration. I mean, it's you know, very poor housing quality, minimal sanitation, um, poor quality services, high rates of crime, high unemployment, and, and you know, Kenya for some is actually you know, very, these are, it's a country with extremely high rates of literacy, educational attainment for women, but yet the jobs simply are not there. And you, know, you might have also heard like Kenya is now the, what do they call it? Um, Silicon Savannah, just like Silicon Valley, but it's now, because it's become such a tech hub, I mean, Nairobi itself, and so yeah, I think it's called Silicon Savannah. Um, and so yeah, most people do have access to mobile phones. There is, of course, some, uh, there is ethnic uh, uh, variation in these places, though interestingly, we didn't actually find so far a whole lot of differences by ethnicity, and this is, and I'm not saying they don't exist, but this is something that, uh, you know, Kenya, it's like an ethnicity, ethnic identity is so important in this country, it always has been, and so there's this question of how that actually links to urbanization, and that's something that, you know, I definitely think needs more work. So these areas are part of the Nairobi Urban Health and Demographic Surveillance Site, which is run by PHRC. And just to give you an idea of sort of what that is. Um, so trash picking is a, is a major form of um, income generation. Uh, these are, you know, I was just talking to um, Emma. I'm sorry, it's Emma, right? Yeah, I mean, just that, or Emily, just in terms of like cholera, these are still, um, you know, there are outbreaks of cholera. So it's pretty, it, it's like a pretty desperate, and every time I go there, it's amazing to me, like how kids like make it through this. So, however, having looked at that, I also think it's important to show kind of more positive things. Um, this is one of my favorite pictures. This is from an urban garden in these communities where they're just using anything possible to, and, and I was just, I thought, wow, this is awesome. So there is amazing entrepreneurship and all of that um, sort of side by side. And I'm always sort of reminded by the field team, like, let's not just, you know, tell everybody about all the bad stuff, but like, you know, this, this is important, so. Um, okay, so, what's next? All right, as I said, we're drowning in data, so we're collecting a lot. And I'm not gonna go through all of this, but I'm happy to talk to anybody about any of it. So we're doing it sort of in three levels. So the, for the mother level, union formalization, which I'm gonna talk, talk to you about, relationship quality, all the household attributes, including size, food security, relative wealth, all the usual stuff. Mental health, which we're just using the CESD 10 scale. Uh, we've got a bunch of sociodemographic on, on mother's education, employment, et cetera. We actually have quite a bit of detailed information that we're collecting on um, income generating activities. So it's beyond just do you work and is it formal, informal, but actually looking at uh, you know, how many activities are you involved in? How many hours do you work? About how much money do you actually make per day? Trying to get more uh, valid measures of actually income that, that's gonna you know, go beyond this. So on the focal child, we're getting physical health, including nutritional status, illness incidence management, and a whole battery of early child development. So everything from gross motor, fine motor, language development, cognitive, socio-emotional, all of that. Um, and I was just talking to, to, uh, to Emily, like this has been a massive learning curve for me, just learning about how this stuff works and trying to actually, because these are, I don't know if people are familiar with this, but this is the stuff where you, you know, figure out if you give them, you can you put beads in a, in a string, can you do this? Like all these various activities and what's actually given, a, a, these places are, you know, so densely packed that oftentimes uh, the field interviewers don't even have the space to actually do the activities. 
So we run into those kinds of issues to actually try to collect this, right? And there are sort of, you know, just you have your kid walk from here to there. Well, there is no space for here to there. So that we've had that kind of, um, those kinds of issues. Um, so the other sort of, I guess, the innovation also is the kin level, right? So what we did was we, this is all from the mother's perspective. And so therefore I fully, you know, full, uh, this is definitely one side of the picture if you like, but it's basically, we're doing an enumeration from the child's perspective of all full half siblings, grandparents, aunts and uncles on both maternal and paternal side. So regardless of whether they're still together, any of that, we're, we're capturing all of that. And also we do also ask about non-kin or also distant kin who pr provide support. We're collecting a whole lot of attributes on these people, age, location, education, employment, type and frequency of communication, and then also the types of support that they provide. So the uh, financial, non-monetary childcare, and emotional. And I'm gonna sort of focus on emotional today. Um, any questions on any of this so far? I tend to talk fast, so please slow me down. <laughs> Yes. Um, so the survey kin is like just a index of the person who are being and then partners of theirs according to Yeah, so it's like mother child dyads, right? Okay. And so and then we're getting collecting the kin because the kin stuff has to be collected from somebody's perspective and so it's from the child's perspective, yeah. Okay, so just to give you some descriptives, um, you know, you're talking, so at the mother level, you know, the, about 24 is the mean age. Um, you know, the, as I said, they're actually uh, quite well educated. Um, as you can see, the unemployment, it's like 66%, um, which is very high, but, uh, but I should point out that that number did change across ways because this was when they had very young children, so in some sense it's expected. The children themselves, that's the age distribution of, um, uh, of, uh, of the kids um, and just a median uh, birth weight. And then for the kin, so these are sort of known surviving kin, right? So obviously, um, and this is, I could talk, I can, there's a whole thing in here about how actually people report kin, because if you're, if you've just started out in a relationship asking, okay, your partner's brothers and sisters, she's like, I don't know. <laughs> no idea. And so even getting at something like survival ends up being quite tricky. So um, so in some sense, even the the uh, how much information people can tell you about these kin is in itself sort of a function of that, you know, the, the relationship, right? So what we have here are about, you know, 15,000 people. And uh, we have, you know, they're about 29 years old. Again, fairly high education. Um, you can see that even here, you've got about 39% unemployed. And about more than half of all kin actually live outside of Nairobi. And I think, again, this is another question about sort of these geospatial uh, features and to what extent in a, in a country in which, you know, connectivity is actually, there's incredible mobile connectivity, including transfer of money. Does this kind of spatial dispersion actually matter? And that's, I think, another question that is important to think about kinship support. But what we are attempting to do is that, so following sort of the mothers, the kids, and to the extent possible, these 15,000 people, um, again, of course, from the mother reporting through six waves of data. So we have the prospective as well about, you know, each, each, each single kin member is we actually ask about. Has their employment change? Has their residence change? Has their support changed? Um, <clears throat> All right, so <laughs> union formalization. Um, so the DHS, which I think lots of people here are aware of the demographic health surveys, the question usually is, you know, what is your current marital status? And it is married, living together as if married. If you're not in union, divorced or separated, widowed, never married. And, but to be fair, I believe that uh, and somebody should correct me if I'm wrong. DHS is also, they've changed a bit, am I right? Because I think they're now saying for those not in union, they are also asking 
Were they ever in union and also getting age at their first cohabitation? I think I got this right. So they have, I mean, there have been some changes made to trying to improve that measure, but there's been a long history of sort of uh, people uh, working with these data just being quite, um, it's pretty limited what you can actually get out of this, right? Okay, so having said that, what did we try to do? Okay, so we know this thing, this thing is a process. And so we came up with these um, seven questions. And we came up with these questions actually through oh, at least a year of like field work well before the project started of doing just uh, focus groups, um, interviews, really trying to nail down how do people actually understand this process and what are the actual salient important markers of this process, right? And so we came, we ended up with these seven questions. Uh, are you living together? Have you been introduced to his family and have, you know, or sorry, the other way around, um, and has he been introduced to your family? And those are actually two distinct phases that actually mean something quite um, sort of a, in terms of how formalized this union is becoming about actually starting to talk about dowry, bride wealth payment, has any of it been paid, the wedding ceremony, and then finally the certificate, which is something that the Kenyan government right now is very, very keen on everybody getting. Um, let me give you a little bit of background to this. Uh, oh, so, well, before that, in this thing, um, so we asked this of everyone, regardless of whether, uh, so in wave one, we asked it of if the current partner, as well as the biological father if it was no longer the current partner. So we could actually have two people who did this with, so retrospectively. So these are all sort of yes, no's, but then we also asked timing. So we also had date, um, so, so that we can actually look at duration of these things, right? Um, and so we did not actually impose a temporal order, meaning that we didn't say, well, we're not gonna ask these questions if you have an access, because in some sense we want to ask, it's an empirical question, whether this is actually something that is time ordered. Um, and why I think this is, and I was just having this conversation with, with Emma about sort of, you know, getting to like something like a wedding ceremony is highly, highly commodified in Kenya. It's the white wedding. People can't afford this. This is aspirational. People cannot actually get there. And maybe it's not, I mean, it's the US, like Charlotte's work, sort of this idea of stratification of marriage. And um, I mean, Maddie, you know all of this very well. I mean, and so definitely in these places, while people will tell you that, yes, I dream about this white wedding in a church with like everybody there. And that's what every, you know, social media feeds are full of very wealthy Kenyans doing this. And like, this is my goal. This just doesn't, this is not a, this is not a reality for folks in this area. And the certificate, you know, again, it's sort of, yes, the, the, the state is sort of interested in trying to get this right because they're sort of concerned with this notion of sort of moral decay and like, you know, families are falling apart, people don't care about marriage anymore and trying all of this stuff that's going on in the, in the background. Um, okay, yes. How do you get the certificate? <laughs> Good question. Um, so my understanding is, is that you know, there is this, it's sort of like a common law marriage thing. And I think right now, if you have been sort of living together for, so they don't bother with any of this, but if you've been living together for, I think it's six months, I need to check. You like go to this, whatever, you got to go to this like municipal office and you register it. But again, if you talk to, I mean, the people in these communities don't take this seriously. They're like, why? <laughs> what is it going to get me? And what the state is trying to say is, oh, no, no, it's going to give you benefits because they're also trying to figure out how to get, you know, uh, uh, father support for children. They're trying to make that sort of a more of a thing. But again, there's a context of high unemployment. <laughs> and so good luck getting that, that done. But that's a great question. And how many people even know about how to do this? And it's frankly not really worth it. I mean, what do you get out of it, right? Um, Okay, so if, can I, is there questions for this? So this was sort of our attempt to get like at a sort of a, oh, and I should say this was, we tested this, we did a bunch of cognitive testing to make sure that these questions were really understood, uh, you know, especially with the Swahili and making sure that, I mean, so there was a lot of time and effort spent into making sure that this actually worked. Um, okay, so 
this is a, it's just a, it's a Sankey diagram, which um, strangely enough, I only learned about not so long ago, but it seemed like a nice way to actually show what we're trying to do, which is that, so on the left-hand side, you've got the sort of DHS categories and the right-hand side. So what we did in our survey was we also asked the DHS questions so that we can actually compare this. And so I think what, sorry, I'm gonna to try to, so I think it's basically this, right? So what is categorized as married or living together is actually a fairly, there's a lot of variation on what that means. Mm -hmm. um, including, for example, you know, these people, so living together with one or both introductions does mean something different than the garden variety living together with nothing. And if you're even one step above by starting bride wealth negotiations, this sort of means something quite different. So, um, so I think this in some sense sort of, uh, you know, and as you can see, obviously when you get, the, the, this is kind of the bulk, right? Like these, these numbers up here are still pretty tiny because very few people are actually getting to that phase of getting to the certificate and the, and the you know, getting to bride wealth, which is gonna take money and who has that? So this in some sense, yeah, so this just descriptively is sort of how this stuff is sort of shaking out in terms of in, in wave one. Yeah. And just to, you know, I'm sure people have already thought of this and I think what we are um, arguing both in this paper as well as some other stuff is that this matters if we think about some of these outcomes, including for example, uh, you know, risk for children. This idea that premarital childbearing or you know, out of uh, non-marital childbearing is seen as, okay, well, problematic because they don't have the resources. Well, what we're saying is, and this was actually a, a paper that we just published in PDR, which sort of, we were putting the timing of childbearing along this in a sequence analysis. And I think what we're, we're suggesting is, well, we should, these are not the same kinds of care networks that are there and who is actually vulnerable, both in terms of the women and the kids, this matters. <coughs> Yeah. Uh, is there ever a big separate relationship ceremony that happens between marriage and any of these tests? Yeah, so these there are these traditional, yeah, that's a great question. So these traditional ceremonies, which is another, oh boy, there's <laughs> volumes on that. Um, well, I mean, Kenya is a highly, I mean, Christianity, a, a very, very, very religious country. And so, the traditional ceremony often is seen as not modern. <laughs> and so it's the white wedding in the church that is kind of the ultimate marker of success, and I've made it. So they sort of confer different kinds of legitimacy, if you like. So it is there, but in terms of, and actually that's, that's a great question because all of these ceremonies are in some, you know, it is sort of talks about the importance of these kin ties, right? I mean, whether it's talking about the church or the traditional, but the ways in which this stuff is now uh, presented as sort of what do you aspire to, that's this, this tension between this pull of the traditional versus what is a modern way of negotiation. All right, um, okay, so <laughs> now, even though we went through all this stuff with, uh, trying to get our, our the questions right, et cetera. When it comes to the data, we needed to see, okay, how do we turn this thing into a, a, an actual measure and how do we have confidence that this thing is actually capturing what we think it's capturing? So, um, so Gutman scaling, which again, apparently is an ancient technique, but uh, Mike, my collaborator is like, you sure you want to say that? And he's like, you're right. But I believe, so I believe now actually, I think rash models and IRT models are sort of the more, you know, modern <laughs> version of this, which we are actually also playing with. But this, we, what we did was, so these Gutman scaling is sort of a, um, it's really, it's like, it's modeling, right? It's basically using um, uh, probabilistic modeling to actually determine whether when you, someone says, it, you know, they have a five as a score, that actually means that the steps before have actually been completed. And so, what it involves is, you know, the seven items were ordered by frequency of occurrence from most frequent to least frequent, so one to seven. And then, um, you know, to assess the cumulative probability of the score, so we just identify the instances where an item with a value less than the scale uh, did not occur. So this would be sort of the error in prediction, right? 
And what you get, at least in wave one, is it's a really, really high. Um, so what this means is, is that if someone has applied, we can be extremely confident that this actually means they completed the steps before that. Not necessarily in that order. So it's not going to tell you that one, you know, two comes after one, but they have completed those, the steps that gets you there. So I think about it more about increasing difficulty and challenge and a sense of actual agency in moving this union progressing forward, if you like. Um, and so in that sense, this cannot actually decrease over time because once you've you know, been introduced, you can't unintroduce. So it can, it can either stall out or keep going. That, I don't know, was it, yeah. Is there any question, yeah. <clears throat> So yeah, I mean, in some sense, you know, like when you get a five, how sure can we be that that five or four, whatever it is, actually means that you've actually completed the relevant steps? Okay. And I would be, I would love to have feedback if, if there's like a, a better way to do this. Um, absolutely open to that. Okay. So just to, so in some sense, this is what it sort of looks like. And but we also have none in there because these are people like nothing has started. And as you can see, so there's all the zeros in here because you can't go backward. So it's just that the red is a diagonal, so most of them are pretty much staying the same. But you do have some of these transitions moving the, you know, moving from intro of her family to those moving to the next step of intro to his family, and then also moving into sort of dowry negotiation. Okay, but for the most part, and actually, if you look at this from wave two to three. It's even, it's, it's even less, so it's also sort of even slowing down even sort of as we go through this. But most of the action is in this introduction thing and not a whole lot down here, but again, this kind of gives you that idea. You know, it's expensive to, like, to go beyond that in terms of dowry, et cetera, right? And let me also make sure I'm talking here about one union and what happens within that union. There's a whole different question about union dissolution and stability, which we will get to, because obviously all of this could be a, a precursor to the union dissolving, which also is obviously happening in our data set. But this one is really, so think about this as in one relationship over time, what's actually happening. Yeah. Well, that's a great question. And yeah. so I think this one, so I think like in the in the in the PDR paper, in fact, that's what we were trying to do is when did child when did actually the birth of the child occur in this thing, right? And you find this uh, quite a lot of heterogeneity as to the timing of that childbirth. Yeah. And and so that I don't even think yeah. that answered your question, but <laughs> Yes, I think that's, yeah. yes, I guess what I'm saying is that, you know, childbirth is yet another factor that is both, um, what, a, uh, is both a, a determinant as well, sort of a, a, an outcome of this kind of formalization process, yeah? Um, okay, and then relationship quality, um, this is not our thing, but this was actually borrowed from subscales that have been used. Um, some of you may be familiar with this. There are three subscales and then the standalone item, commitment, trust, communication. And so we just put it through a bunch of uh, confirmed tree factor analysis. Again, pretty high um, CFI and um, REMSIA. And then we got some RQ predicted scores from using this empirical Bayes method, which is really just this unique uh, that the prior probability distribution is not fixed. Um, and so we end up with a range from negative eight to, uh, to eight. So what this looks like is so these are just, and we didn't do this in wave two. So we're also following obviously the, you know, what has happening in these relationship quality over time. And I think the basic story here is, you know, as you can see, most of it sort of is hovering and more leaning towards positive. And, but though I think there is actually from going over time, um, there is seems to be a little bit more of moving towards a more negative on, on, on all of these subscales, okay? Um, 
And then if you just actually do it with union formalization, this is another way to sort of confirm that at least it's working in the way we expect it to, that uh, uh, sort of with union formalization getting more, more formalized that you actually see higher scores. Yes? In your example, was there a requirement that the index child was the first child, or are you acknowledging that this child? We didn't do that. Uh, but these are pretty young. Well, no, not all of them. No, and you're right. So and and so yes, there are in some cases that they've had children from other partners. Yes, that is there. With the Vienna fact, were there any cases where there were not two children in the partners, or was it yeah? Yes, yes, and we yeah, yes, and I mean having two zero to twenty four months is yeah. there were a few, and then we just sort of randomly selected one, okay. but there were say cases in which there were over the age of you know. Three of the sure, but you didn't show one. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's, I mean, I think this is sort of what, I mean, I'm not going to talk about this, the issue about the childbearing, but it is absolutely, so there's this question, right? So having a child, does that sort of uh, speed up to dowry payment? Um, or, and, and the vast, you know, that when you look at, I don't have it here, but if you look at our sequence analysis, you'll see that the vast majority are happening well before the dowry payment. Because the problem is, is like the dowry payment is happening in such, like there's so, it's, it's just so hard to do this and actually get the dowry paid. So it's, and that's where sort of the, the economic kind of um, pressure shows up. Okay, and lastly, just to finish up the measures, the emotional support. Um, and as I told you, we asked for each kin, kin member, are they giving you advice, assurance, comfort, companion, friendship? And then we just, it was just a continuous um, measure of number of people over the age who provide this um, with the median of, of, of four. Um, okay, and so what does all this have to do with mental health? I mean, I think it's basically what I, what we're thinking about is sort of does the union formalization, how formalized a union is, it might have a direct effect on the risk of depression just because you feel more secure, or it may be actually working through better relationship quality, if indeed it is a positive effect, or is it working through actually more emotional support from more akin because now this thing is more socially recognized and people have more of an investment in seeing this thing succeed. So that's kind of how we're thinking about um, the model. Okay, and just to give you the, in terms of depression, there's about a quarter of the sample that's either at moderate um, or high risk. And this number actually, this is at wave one, and I'm pretty sure that it is actually going up over waves, so. Um, and again, these are communities in which there's very little, you know, space for treatment. Okay. Uh, these are not, so I, at, uh, at risk for depression, union formalization, and the mediators I just told you, we're using some cross lag models to predict depression risk and subsequent wave as a function of UF, which you can also get it, uh, test for reverse causality in those models, and then just the mediation models to look at the extent to which RQ and emotional support um, actually, uh, are there any indirect effects through that, and a whole lot of controls at the mother level. Um, and also, and this one, it's a pretty select sample. I'm really just focusing on the 745 mothers who are in all three waves and in the same relationship, just to kind of keep this simple. But I'm fully aware that, you know, it's a very, very select sample. Okay, so this is just to start out with the conventional, shall we say, the DHS. <laughs> so married versus living together, right? And what you see here is, that there's really no effect. I mean, the, obviously, the, the, there is no, in either direction, either uh, marriage predicting depression or depression predicting marriage. There's uh, really nothing going on. Um, however, so when you switch this to the union formalization um, kind of measure, what we're finding is not much is happening in the first interval, but in the second interval. So what you find is, is that people with more formalized unions in wave two have uh, lower odds of depression in wave three. Um, and there is some you know, indication that there may be some reverse causality going on here with women who were at risk for depression in wave two 
ending up uh, sort of a negative effect on uf over wave, uh, at wave three. And remember I said you can't actually go backwards. So what we think this is actually getting at, these are the people who are not progressing. So it's sort of you know stagnant versus those people who are progressing, and that's what I think is going on here. But so what? So and in some sense, this would you know it, it does it does intuitively make sense that there is something about the the union becoming more formalized, which seems to uh, help with mental health, and also that yes, we know that mental health would have an effect also in in um, in, in in formalizing the union. So when it comes to mediation models, um, there isn't really anything going on with emotional support. So if you think about that as kind of the kin level, like the role of kin in doing this, they don't really seem to be, you know, it's not really explaining anything in terms of those effects. But the relationship quality is huge. So I mean, both of these, basically, when you have uh, higher UF, it's definitely, and a lot of this effect is almost entirely, it's working through relationship quality. So that you know, more formalized unions seem to be associated with much better relationship quality, which in turn is helping with uh, mental health. Yeah. Um, and and so, oh, so, so the, the one of the problems with this, of course, is that we are sort of mixing up. This is a uh, this is a coefficient that's an odds ratio, and uh, you know that might we go. Wait a minute, that's not right to kind of compare those. Um, and so what we did was we ran it again just as a sensitivity to just change it into just well, having both of them at the same scales, and you still find the same effect just to make sure that that, that part's actually covered. And then I think the last thing is we kind of put in both, right? And so um, when you put in both, you do, you know, that, that effect still remains, but now you're actually seeing the emotional support effect also kicking in, and I'm still trying to work through what may be going on, but it's sort of this double mediation that relationship quality is also working through, no, sorry, yeah, the effect of emotional support is actually working through relationship quality. There's, some, there's like a, a triangle going on that it's improving relationship quality, but that's also feeding into better emotional support, which is then linking into um, depression. So that's yeah, so that's kind of where we're at. Um, so basically, uh, internal mental health is sensitive to union formalization. The more formalized, the better the mental health. This may be because women may feel more secure with the involvement of kin, both financial and for social legitimacy. We think this may be a better predictor than your sort of conventional measure. There is some evidence of reverse causality, which we need to be concerned about. And then that uh, this is happening both through uh, relationship quality, which is um, kind of the, the couple aspect of it, but also the, uh, but it's also, it seems to be that more formalized unions may be activating more emotional support for men. Uh, so, oh, just a shameless plug for our paper, but more importantly, <laughs> This is a highly select sample, so I, we are trying to actually figure out ways to now bring in all the dissolution stuff, uh, union instability, um, timing of childbearing, and then also looking at all the child outcomes we have, and thinking about doing some growth modeling, to looking at physical and cognitive, um, and also the qualitative data, of which we have mounds, which could also be brought in here. <laughs> um, and then finally, just um, funding acknowledgement and uh, and thank you. And that is the website. And uh, I'm happy to, yeah, just take questions or not. We did not have another one crinkling our papers. Um, it's OK if we. Oh, right. OK. So the, the folks in the room. So. <laughs> um, Thank you so much. This is really exciting. I have two questions. Mm. Um, the first is I'm really interested in kind of the um, the formalization of marriage. Yeah. Um, and I'm wondering if there are steps that are particularly meaningful or symbolic. Um, obviously, you know, the aspirational white wedding being the most, but 
you know, of the steps that are prevalent in your sample, are there some that seem to make more of a difference? Um, and then the second question, if I can just put both of them on the table, I'm thinking about um, like the, the comparison with the DHS is real. I've for so long been frustrated by that question um, and its limitations. I'm, I'm curious as somebody who's worked in many parts of Africa about your thoughts about um, how we can think about marriage formalization as something that could be examined yeah. cross-nationally with so many differences in sort of yeah. what the symbolic markers are in certain yeah. places. So. Yeah, no, um, so on the first one, I think at this point what it's those introduction sermon. The introduction stuff is actually really, really important. And if you, I wish I had the sequence analysis to show you, but that's a really critical piece. And particularly, uh, the, it's the second one that he's introducing her to his family, mm -hmm. which is also then activating like more paternal kin investment. Um, so if you look at it from sort of a child investment perspective, that one is actually really critical to kind of to get that done. Yeah. So that's kind of, I think that's the answer to that. Your second one, you're absolutely right. So it's fine and you know, it's, it's easy for me to sort of criticize the DHS, but at the same time, not really <laughs> up with a, how do we improve? So I think this is, you know, something like this. Yes, you're right. I mean, is, is, it, you know, is it feasible to kind of, we can't just put this into a, you know, plot this into a DHS and go do this. But um, there are similarities in sort of these, the types of stuff, you know? Right. So that was kind of what we were, I think that's what we're, that's exactly it. I mean, trying to identify the salient steps. Um, I mean, I remember, you know, we were talking about this for the Nepal stuff. I mean, even in like the shift from arranged marriages to uh, the couple oriented, I, I think, yeah, I mean, this is a totally unsatisfactory answer, but I think that would be, and how feasible that is, I honestly don't know. <laughs> but I would actually, I'm hoping that I, I would like to actually talk to some folks at DHS and actually see whether they would be interested in partnering to try to figure out a way to do this. You know, I think, I mean, as marriage is an institution, I mean, I think it's changing globally, obviously, it's not just here, right? But it is still an important part of social life. And it, you know, and, and so, and it is, I think in this kind of context, as you know, sort of economically, social legitimacy, these are really critical for like livelihood um, and, you know, sort of these intergenerational effects for your children. So, and Kenya is in the middle of all of this hectic changing of policies around family law and divorce when, I'm not sure they actually have, I mean, you're already talking about divorce when it's not clear they've got the marriage parts figured out. So I think there's, and it's being done in a kind of uh, sort of this moral panic about, and that's always sometimes worrying about those. I had a question about the mixed methods approach you used mm -hmm. and sort of what you gained from that. So how did you um, utilize, you know, the data as you were in the field collecting sort yeah. of surveys and, um, and and related to that, I was wondering if you spoke in your in your focus groups um, to just younger people or if you also spoke to like the grandparent generation, because yeah. I'm curious how the older generation is viewing these changes and how they view what's an important marker versus the, the folks that are marrying. Yeah. So in the first question, um, so we try, so what we did was we actually, uh, from, so because they're interspersed between the waves, so we actually get some, let's call it a cheat sheet of sort, <laughs> and you give it, and they are actually having it there while they're having these in-depth, so for example, in union formalization, <coughs> you say, okay, sort of tell me the story about how this unfolded. Um, and how do you, how do you, you know, what is your relationship with your kin and all of those things? They're actually using sort of some of what, I mean, not to kind of, uh, you know, to, uh, to force it in there, but just so that there is kind of uh, a little more effort at uh, trying to triangulate what we're finding, but also the men. So one of the big ones, wow. of course, we don't know anything from men, right? And so that's why we had, so we had men actually. Uh, draw some kinship diagrams and provision networks. So we had them actually tell us sort of like, who are they actually now supporting? I mean, their fertility history, their partners, 
their relationship to Ken. Um, and so we have that as well. And actually, I've got a student who's doing this interesting qualitative analysis on these integrated Ken networks and that kind of thing. So, yeah, and of course, and, and longitudinally, that we haven't even started that now, I'm trying to actually follow this, but yeah. And oh, and I'm sorry, the, uh, the grandparents' generation versus yeah, the I have to look. I I think there was actually yeah no it was um, I'm pretty sure there was actually like they were sort of stratified in the in the in those focus groups that we had actually a group that it meant the parent of the person who's marrying but who is yeah, like yeah, anticipating yeah. grandkids right yeah, so yeah. <laughs> yes I do think we did that now exactly what. Yeah, I wonder how much they care about stuff, but right. the Instagram yes. wedding versus, you know, is it really the dower negotiation or, you know, it'd be interesting in the kin network to see if folks agreed about like what's actually important or should you go get that certificate or, you know. Yeah, no, 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 absolutely. And I think, yeah, I mean, I think as we know, like, the certificate is something from the state is always <laughs> you actually, but, um, but at the same time though, I think what I would like Oh, there would be some way to somehow feed this into a more thoughtful social policy that yeah. might, you know, could end up providing support to particularly women and children in these ways that, in that, you know, exactly what, how that works out, I, <laughs> I don't know, but yeah. Um, I was thinking about the figure you had at the beginning the extent to which people had reached certain yeah. milestones in the union population. Mm -hmm. And you started with the DHS yeah. level measure, and the vast majority reported that they were married or living as a married. Um, I'm curious, among people who report that they are married, what kind of, is there a specific, because a lot of them hadn't, you know, had a ceremony or a certificate or um, even had finish like is it more that they are living as married or yeah um, I guess it makes a person recognize themselves as married um if, if there is such a switch in the, the way that it may be in other places yeah lives. so I guess that is sort of what we were trying to get at I mean yeah. when you sort of answer that DHS question as I'm married for living together because you don't have all of these, you know. right? And so, what is it that you're? And I think what we're basically trying to figure out is, you know, to kind of like that Sankey diagram. The person, you know, ten people saying living together. There is actually a spectrum of what that looks like. But what's important about that is about sort of support and how they feel about how secure they are in that relationship, which. You know, you would argue matter for, in this case, mental health, but also for children and economic stability. And all this stuff. I mean, I didn't show you here all the, the financial support, and that's another thing, obviously, we can look at. Does formalization mean you get more financial support, even if it's not dowry, but our paternal kin now actually providing more support for that kid, right? And that's something we need to do. Um, is that, that's what one would expect if you're sort of moving in that direction, then the secure is more. I mean, interestingly, I mean, we talked, I mean, I'm thinking about even the US with like, we were talking about Kathy Eden's work, like all, like how, you know, in, in those communities, the, the, trying to get sort of support from the fathers um, is actually super important to. Welfare, and regardless of where this relationship is going to go, I mean, that's almost, it can also be looked at almost like independent, their connection to this child, right? Which is what we were trying to also, so there's the marriage piece, but there's also the, the links to the child piece. There's that intergenerational piece as well. Uh, thank you for a very wonderful presentation. I, I, you know, there are so many uh, things I, I love. Uh, I, I have a very naive question. Number one is, I'm wondering whether you also interviewed unmarried people and compare whether the married people, uh, what is the difference in difference, prevalence of difference between unmarried versus married? So, I'm curious, I mean, you may, 
you yeah, have to um, hear only for the mariners, right? So I think in some sense, that's part of the, the challenge is how somebody even sees themselves. I mean, I think that was sort of your yeah. question. So does the state see someone who has had, you know, introduced to somebody as married? I don't know, you know, I mean, for, for them, you need the certificate, which may be in the absence of any of that stuff. Just give me the piece of paper and then we're gonna count you as married right, right. for our state. But then that doesn't actually have any real implications for somebody's social positioning or their financial security or any of that. So, so I think, did we talk to people? It depends on, probably, but it depends on who would have considered them as unmarried. Is that, yeah. It's, yeah. But that's kind of one of the actually, I think that's one of the, the kind of big issues in this sort of measurement issue of marriage and particularly as an important yeah, my second question was related to that. Uh, I mean, here you, we are talking of formalization. Mm -hmm. I was thinking more of formation of union. I'm sorry, for? Formation, union formation. Yeah. 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 If there is any variation in union formation, or yeah. If that, yeah. there is, so, then how would that impact? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's actually the next step. <laughs> So we, we, I didn't show any of that, but we can actually look at that as well, particularly and also looking at things like multi-partner fertility and how, so we, we have all that data, so we can actually look at that. So I don't have the answer for you today, but we, but that's certainly very important. Yeah, that would be interesting. Yeah. Thank you. I have another question. Um, did you ask respondents about their provision of emotional support to extended yeah, care? Yeah. It, it seems sort of like what you were showing was more like it receipt, yeah. but I'd be curious also about that provision. Yeah, so that's been the, so what we have is the, we went back and forth about this, so the reciprocity issue, right? So we don't quite say, do you get, what did we say? We said, uh, First of all, for any, uh, oh, how would you thank them? Would you, why did we do this? Because instead, there, was a, there was actually a good reason for doing this way, <laughs> that we did not just say, do you provide, you know, but we rather, if they did provide, then we said, how would you thank them? Would it be in kind? Would it be thank you? That kind of thing. And I have to look more closely, but I think the vast majority were, Thank you. <laughs> because, I mean, what's weird is, you know, the, the traditional sort of migration rural to urban is that, you know, you, it's the remittances are supposed to be working <laughs> urban to rural. And now it's these, all these people coming to these cities, which are, and it's, they're, they're stuck. I mean, they have kids, they have, you know, and so they're actually depending on actually even food transfers from rural communities in Kenya which are actually coming in, which is actually supporting things like even, um, uh, even, even like the food security question. They're actually dependent on some you know, food coming from, and actually uh, my colleagues actually looking, gonna be looking at rainfall maps and looking at how disruptions to rainfall has actually been sort of interrupting, which then links into the climate change and all that stuff, because Kenya's had all these droughts and then rain and all this stuff, yeah. I have to cut us off now yes. um, for the next meeting with the trainees, yes. but thank you so much audience and thank you so much to our speaker for a fascinating, I can't wait to hear more about this over the next few years. Thank you. Thank you.